I'm going to turn to a second topic here, which is about the intermediaries and the routes north of cocaine during this period. Um, very important topic because mobile and long distance drugs like cocaine, which is still the case with cocaine, um, need kind of risk taking entrepreneurs, intermediaries. They need pit stops, they need way stations that bridge these remote zones of tropical production and are able to cross safely to um, um, faraway sites of consumption. During the 1950s, with the incentives that were hatched in Peru, this new internationalist smuggling class emerges and they were ever more professional, daring, financed, and elusive. And this was a group that uh, began to be actively promoting both new centers and cultures of consumption in Havana, in New York, and a number of other Latin American cities. And, and then, especially as we'll see, linkages to supplies of Bolivian coca paste. Now, the first one of these intermediary, intermediary zones is um, Chile, um, which is not a country that is actually usually associated in the mind with drugs at all. Um, but Chile was the first entrepot, the first major entrepot for the international cocaine trade. Um, it was say that you could say Chile was the Colombia of the um, cocaine trade during the 1950s and 1960s. It was where illicit cocaine was organized and mobilized. Um, and especially important in this was the dynamic role that was played by the Wasaf Harb clan. This was a, a family of so-called Turcos, that means people of Middle Eastern extraction, um, in the northern part of Chile, uh, in the city of Valparaiso, and uh, using the uh, port of Arica. And this was a family with very extended family and political connections in both Bolivia and in um, the United States. And it's no accident that, um, as we'll see a little bit uh, ahead, that in cocaine um, or in drugs globally, ethnic groups are oftentimes the pioneers um, in um, inventing or mobilizing uh, illicit drugs um, in the case of, of, of cocaine after World War II, not only the Turcos throughout the region, but also you found a lot of Jewish refugees uh, and a lot of German refugees, and oftentimes all mixed uh, together in the same place, like um, 1950s Bolivia. Now, between 1950 and 1965, this Wasaf Harb clan perfected they intensified cocaine traffic north, despite a great deal of police attention, or at times police complicity, in their very far-flung networks. What they pioneered from um, Chile was this network that went from, now you're out of Chile, now you're definitely in the way. What they pioneered was this route that went from Bolivia down to the coast here to Arica, and then they would funnel the cocaine up through, usually through Mexico, and into markets in the United States, particularly in the east coast of the United States. And that was their trademark routing of Andean cocaine. And in that way, they were able to outflank what was um, their only real competitors in this game, who were the Cuban um, sellers of cocaine that we'll get into in just a little bit. Um, anyway, there are a lot of interesting things that one could say about the Wasaf Harb clan or about Chile, but I'm going through this very briefly to give you an overview of what these developments were. In the mid-1960s, uh, there was a bust, a big bust, a breakup of, of the Wasaf gang. Uh, particularly under United States pressure to end this quite open peddling in cocaine in Chile. Um, but the result of that was not the end of the cocaine trade from Chile, but almost the opposite, is that you had hundreds of other Chileans jump into the cocaine trade. It became a much more competitive trade by the late 1960s, making Chile the 
predominant, by far, cocaine corridor to the United States until the fall of democracy in Chile in 1973.